Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Alex Tesmer. I'm an associate uh, director for a company called Becton Dickinson. We're all about the patient first and about advancing the world of health. Uh, and one thing you might not know about me is, and I'm sure most of you, you know, at some point, we all become patients, right? And I found out uh, at an early age of 25 uh, that uh, I had hearing loss. And I kept saying what to my wife. And she's like, you gotta get in, you gotta get your ears checked out. I'm like, I'm 25 and I'm fine. Uh, but sure enough, I went into uh, the office of the clinic and uh, they diagnosed me. I had lost my high frequency range in my hearing. And it was primarily probably due to uh, going out to clubs and going to concerts, and then I had a loud stereo. So uh, I'm always telling them, I have four children, so I'm always telling them, be careful, because they like to li listen to loud music as well. Uh, you could lose your hearing. But I'm happy to be here today uh, to moderate my voice, patients as advocates. And so I'm gonna be asking questions here, uh, and we'll start off right here to the, to the right of me, and this is, um, Mark, and, the, the, and I'm going to ask each of this, so Mark, Claire, and George, and so here's the first question or statement. Please introduce yourself and share your story. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm in awe of some of the speakers earlier, so it's uh, certainly a tough act to follow. My name's Mark Geiger. Um, I work for Anuncia Medical here, headquartered in Scottsdale. Um, and um, I have hydrocephalus also. Hydrocephalus, as you may have heard our CEO talk yesterday, is an abnormal accumulation of cerebral spinal fluid in the brain. Um, you, it affects children, but um, also adults. In fact, the aging population is, uh, is the fastest growing area of hydrocephalus. It can uh, be caused by spina bifida when you're born, or trauma, or hemorrhagic stroke, or any intraventricular hemorrhage, or a condition called no normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is often misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. So you have essentially an implant rerouting fluid from inside of your brain through a small hole in the skull with a valve, and draining that fluid into your peritoneal cavity, which, uh, where it's reabsorbed. But 50% of shunts fail in the first year or in the first two years, 80% in five years. And so it's not uncommon to find patients with five, 10, 15, 20, 30 shunt surgeries. I had five. I was diagnosed at 14. I had five revision surgeries, which is a hospitalization, changing out the plumbing, um, all in high school. And my last one was when I was 18 years old. So uh, I've been uh, doing well. Uh, relatively well since, uh, knock on wood. Um, and uh, talking about the team, someone mentioned earlier the team approach is, is you know, without my mother <coughs> and family practitioner, I wouldn't be here. My mother kept saying, something's wrong. You're 14. You shouldn't be having headaches every day. And so I got diagnosed Friday night, had the shunt surgery uh, Saturday morning. And um, uh, it was a, it was a, tough road during high school, which is tough for everybody, but um, the good thing that came out of it is my mother said, you know what, you, you should work for one of these shunt companies. Um, I wanted to work for IBM um, in 1991, and uh, I got an entry-level job in customer service for a shunt company. My career now has been 32 years medical device, instruments, equipment, implants, a lot in CSF management. I've got a couple of US patents for uh, cerebral spinal fluid management. And it, it really changed my life. And I'm um, you know, very happy to be where I am. Um, I left a good job to come to this company because they, someone finally designed and developed a way to go after the number one cause for shunt revision, which is occlusion or clogging of the ventricular catheter. And I said, somebody finally did this, and I, I want to be a part of it. And, uh, you know, very happy to be here. Thank you, Mark. And Claire? Hi, is this on? I guess so. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Claire, and uh, I have notes because chemo brain is real, <laughs> if any of you have had it. So um, here's a little of my story. A little more than six years ago, 
I noticed swelling um, in my right breast and unusual symptoms of redness. And I immediately called my doctor because I don't like to have my head in the sand. And she promptly sent me for a mammogram and an ultrasound. Within hours, I was given the all clear. No signs of malignancy and a recommendation to follow up in six months. But my doctor saved my life when she called me back for a second look and referred me for an MRI. Three weeks after I was told I was cancer free, I was diagnosed with stage 3B inflammatory breast cancer, also known as IBC. It's a very rare and aggressive disease. A 13 centimeter tumor had invaded my breast and it tunneled into my lymph nodes, all while hiding out from standard imaging. There's no stage one or two diagnosis for IBC. The earliest possible diagnosis is at stage three. Most of the time, and unlike other breast cancers, there's no lump. Mammograms and ultrasounds are typically ineffective for diagnosing IBC. What you need is an MRI. And it was hard for me to get it, <laughs> but I'll tell you about that in a few. I went through 16 rounds of chemo. I had a radical mastectomy. I had 25 lymph nodes removed, and then I had 33 rounds of radiation. I had an excellent treatment outcome, and I was declared NED, no evidence of disease. But then, <laughs> in the first weeks of 2021, the unimaginable happened. I was diagnosed with a second case of stage 3B IBC in my remaining breast. I'm one of a small number of people, probably fewer than five, who've had two primary cases of inflammatory breast cancer. For the second cancer, I did 20 rounds of chemo, and I had another radical mastectomy, and they took 38 lymph nodes. That's why my arm looks like this. I had 42 rounds of radiation, and for 18 months thereafter, I took daily oral chemo. As a result of the two cancers, I've been bald twice, and being immune compromised has become a way of life. Following 75 rounds of radiation directed at my chest, I wake up in a radiation straitjacket every day. I have lymphedema in both arms and hands, as you can see, and that has really changed my lifestyle a lot, particularly with exercise and recreational activities. This past July, a routine scan caught that old cancer on the loose again and now I'm a stage four metastatic breast cancer. It's also known as MBC, as some of you may know. I'm back in active treatment, but I get to keep my hair this time, <laughs> at least for now. And um, so far I'm doing pretty well with the side effects. I'm feeling good today. And I'm hoping that uh, the temperatures are gonna go down and that that'll give me a little break from all the lymphedema swelling. Well, good morning. My name is George, as it shows behind me very nicely. Uh, it was when I was 16 that I first began to notice depression, being depressed, not being my old self. And now, I just passed 66, so that's 50 years of living with major depressive disorder. And it comes and it goes. So in telling my story, I can say I was fortunate to be able to graduate from college. But I didn't have the GPA to go to med school, so I admire all of you. I have a degree in chemistry, and uh, my research advisor in college co-invented the transistor. So having the fact that you did research with a Nobel laureate really looks good on a resume. The fact that it's true looks better. <laughs> uh, but, but I see myself not as an el elder, if you forgive me, but as that same 21-year-old um, with just a holdover to transistors, a holdover to when IBM first came out with their PC, a holdover over to the Beatles, a holdover to the past. And I'm not alone in this. 
I think um, Bruce Springsteen is coming out for, for a concert. Is that right, Joan? Yeah. Oh, canceled. Well, somebody else who is big in the 70s will come out. You can be sure. What I wanted to share to be a little quick on the whole depression side is that for me, with respect to biopharmaceuticals, it took a long time to develop what are now the SSRIs. And so for many years, I was a biomedical engineer, but I had too much of an anti-anxiety medication and nothing for depression. So that wasn't positive for a career. But I was on the Swan Dance team. For the folks at Beckton Dickinson, I made catheters for a long time. And then I became depressed. And then I started working for Beckman Instruments. And there, uh, once again, Dr. Beckman invented the spectrophotometer and the pH meter. And as a part of a team, we came up with a potassium ion selective electrode. And that's where I got my sole invention and disclosure. But now when they measure potassium anywhere in the world, I've got an ion in there. Okay. Finally, it wasn't until 1998 that I received a, a medication that could deal with the depression and also from the perspective of biopharmaceuticals, they took us all off of Ativan or lorazepam. So I don't know if you know, but lorazepam was one of the most prescribed drugs, five prescribed drugs in the United States. And it was used to help all the people who were anxious at night about sleeping go to sleep. So it wasn't necessarily, it was a uh, moiety. But anyway, since 1998, when I received my disability recognition, I've been advocating for people with serious mental illness. And I'll talk more about that shortly. Thank you, George. For our next question for the panel, how important our patient voices in creating good policy? Great question. Um, I was lucky enough to be on the board of directors of a worldwide organization called the Hydrocephalus Association for six years in the early 2000s. I ran a couple of marathons to raise money for the Hydrocephalus Association, which is a 501c3 patient advocacy group. And we used to have a large meeting every couple of years for patients and in moderating sessions and meeting parents and patients, you really see the impact um, in, in hydrocephalus. It's a $2 billion cost. Uh, it was a $2 billion cost to the healthcare system 10 years ago for all of these failed implants. In fact, our chief medical officer would say it's the most failed implanted technology ever. And um, the Hydrocephalus Association moved their headquarters from San Francisco to Washington, D.C. to help uh, be near the hill so that they could describe the impact of not just the patients and the cost of the healthcare system, but the impact to the families of all these repeat neurosurgical procedures um, um, that a lot of these patients and their families endured. So uh, having that voice through a patient advocacy group um, was very powerful. And, and having inviting uh, lawmakers and, uh, and the like to our shows, to different meetings, gave them that firsthand experience. Um, one, uh, one of Nancy, Nancy Pelosi's uh, top uh, aides had a son uh, na or named Elijah with hydrocephalus, and he came to one of our meetings and this child was fantastic, but um, the father, you know, got involved because he was impacted. And a lot of people here got into medical device because they have family members or they have, uh, they have a condition themselves that gets them the medical device. But it needs to be bigger than that. 
and, and I can't say enough about, you know, the concept of, especially for the young people here, why not me, why not now? Thank you. And Claire? So patient advocacy, I'm pretty emotional about that. And I can tell you, I would not be here today. I would not be alive today without patient advocacy. As recently as 2006, the life expectancy for inflammatory breast cancer from diagnosis to death was two years. Very little research funding was allocated to IBC. That still is the case because it was assumed that all the women were gonna die anyhow. Patient advocacy led to the creation of the IBC clinic at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. And there's also one very determined survivor out there who established the IBC Network Foundation, which is the largest funder of IBC-specific research in the United States. The majority of breast cancer deaths, which is about 43,000 every year, are due to stage four disease. But only about five to 7% of breast cancer research funds are devoted to studying um, treatments for stage four metastatic breast cancer, and even the smallest smidgen of that goes to inflammatory breast cancer. But there is progress, and it is due to the brave bold women who insisted on research for stage four patients. Six, since 2016, the FDA has approved 10 new drugs for metastatic breast cancer, and I've been on one of them, and I expect to be on others in the future. I cannot convey in words my deep gratitude for the courageous women, many of whom are no longer with us, who spoke up. Their voices gave me more time. But we still need to move the needle. We need advocates out there. When I encountered my reoccurrence last summer, the number one recommendation from my treatment team was a clinical trial. I left that appointment with a folder full of information and a heart full of hope. Four hours later, I received a call telling me that I was not eligible for that clinical trial because I had inflammatory breast cancer. That was a gut punch. <laughs> We, IBC ladies, are typically excluded from breast cancer clinical trials because, among other things, we bring down the mortality rates. People of color are also disproportionately excluded from clinical trials. Everybody needs an opportunity for cutting edge cancer treatment. And I'll just sum up my thoughts about advocacy. I saw this on a poster at Banner. The true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit. Sometimes that's exactly what advocacy is about. Well, I'll start with a cliche, nothing about us without us. This has been a popular and true um, voice for advocacy. One of my early mentors shared with me here in Arizona that to be an advocate is to know the law as well as, if not better than, the person on the other side of the table. And so for my advocacy, it's been primarily at the state level. And as you all graduate, or as you all have lived through, we had a class action lawsuit to improve the quality of mental health care in the Valley. And that was 20 years ago. Now we're working with the, so that the judicial branch. Now we're looking with the legislative branch to improve the behavioral health care system in the Valley. And that's positive. There are ongoing surveys uh, about group homes and ongoing surveys about the crisis system from which we'll have data to make decisions to expand the community services. And then finally, the executive branch. We've been very fortunate, a group that I advocate with, to be invited to the governor's table and to work with her on 
and improvement plan for the Arizona State Hospital. And I'm very excited about that. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> and to kind of conclude very briefly, how can we best work together? Very quickly. Um, yeah, just a, a quick story. It's the connectivity and, and being here with all of these people. I, in, in hydrocephalus, is a very niche business that has a very large impact, but uh, famous story is two guys were watching a fire, a big fire in Santa Barbara on the hillside, one named Ted Heyer, another named Rudy Schulte, and they started saying, well, what do you do? Oh, well, I'm working in medical devices. What do you do? Oh, I'm a machinist from Germany working on small parts for watches and things like that. Really, maybe you can help me because I'm trying to build this little valve that's an implanted device to control flow of CSF out of somebody's head. Maybe you can help me. And the company Higher Schulte was created and has impacted a lot of lives. It became American Hospital Products, which became Baxter, which has became a number of different things since then. And then other companies started to blossom, but it's that connectivity. And this was happenstance. Right, but you, Arizona Bio, AZ Bio, and organizations like it are making that deliberate. Of, you know, I was listening to Stan with the ponytail yesterday. Couldn't wait to grab him after his talk to say, "Gosh, we should talk about inflammation and inflammatory mediators because, you know, we're doing some work in that space. Maybe we can help each other." And it's that connectivity that creates breakthrough technologies that help people. Thank you. And Claire. So a couple things that I think are really important and um, I mentioned the MRI earlier that saved my life. It was really hard to get and my doctor actually told me while she was fighting to get that stat MRI approved, she said to call Senator McCain's office for support. And when a doctor orders a stat MRI, you shouldn't have to appeal to the US Senate. And so I'm hoping that we can move past some of that. The other thing is that I've gotten a lot of specialty care at the IBC clinic at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, probably saved my life because there's very unique treatment protocol for IBC. Many oncologists only see one or two cases in their career. And if you don't see a lot of cases, you're not really familiar with it. But a lot of insurances don't allow people to travel out of state for specialty care. So we need to fix that. That's, that's really, really critical. The other thing is that um, I love the technologies. They're awesome. Um, I've, I'm a three-time chemo port person. Wouldn't go anywhere without that chemo port. We gotta make sure that the technologies include everybody. And then my last final thought. I've been a cancer patient for more than six years now. And I will tell you that it's the little things that matter. And they matter a lot. And so I know medicine's really, really specialized, but I just want to say, can we add more, one more specialty? And that's to specialize in kindness. I can tell you that I have undergone very painful, stressful, difficult procedures that I actually remember fondly because I was treated so well. You know, and conversely, you never forget when you're treated poorly. And so I know that this may sound a little crazy, but you know, when you go to Dutch Brothers and, and they're also happy to see you and they have a big smile on their face and they ask you how you're doing. And I really would love to see the Dutch Brothers model integrated into healthcare because it can make such a difference just to have somebody smile and say, hey, how you doing? And so, um, I, that's my recommendation. I would love it. And those are the things that me, as a cancer patient, that I will remember. Thank you, Claire. And George? So Joe Biden walked the picket lines. Well, good for him. Our, uh, and that is not a plug for Joe Biden. That is to say that his leadership is focusing on health care and better health care here in the United States. And the way that he's engaging people is what's called peer support. So you'll hear 
a lot of talk about engaging peers, and these are people with lived experience. So as you do your work, and you hear there's a peer support person, I ask you to please welcome them. The other way that we can really work together is to vote. And then a third way that we can work together is know what legislative district you're in. Say that's legislative district five and dog your legislators. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, George. That wraps up our panel.